Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of the Daily Friends Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Marius Ruert, the voice of the people, the lion of the East Rand. How are you? How's it, Nick? How's it going? It's going pretty well. Um, pretty well for a Monday, I suppose. And Mr. Gabriel Krauser, the wild long man of the, I guess, center of Joburg? <laughs> no, I wish. Not anymore. Not anymore. Oh, but I'm I'm very glad. And I'm so glad to see a bit of Marius' uh, bookshelf and his Spider-Man poster. I think it, <laughs> it's Art Deco. It looks like it came straight out of Paris in the 1890s from the brush of Toulouse <laughs> Lautrec, showing that there really is class in Benoni. It's very good. Exactly. I think, I'm not sure what the books are behind me. I think they're all kind of sci-fi stuff. I don't think it's my stuff that I put out to impress people, I think. <laughs> uh, Sci-fi is good stuff. Sci-fi is good stuff. And uh, for those who are listening to the audio only, um, you can check us out on YouTube. We are then now there. And if you just search for The Daily Friend Show, um, you should be able to find us pretty easily. Uh, and then you can see our, our glorious smiling faces. Or maybe you don't. But anyway, <laughs> let us move on to our first story of the day. And this one is uh, is quite sad. It actually happened on, I think it was Thursday last week um, or Friday. Anyway, uh, Minister in the Presidency, uh, Jackson and Tem Tembu died. Um, Jackson and Tembu was quite well liked by uh, a lot of people outside of the ANC. He was regarded as one of the best people in the ANC. Um, I know that uh, uh, there's certainly people in the DA feel that way. And um, he had a reputation for being uh, a cut above a lot of the other, a lot of the other members of the ANC. And of course, this, you know that organization is today filled with so many devious characters. But um, just a little bit about him. Uh, he was born in uh, 1958 in Vitbank. Um, he he joined the ANC during apartheid. He was involved in uh, becoming a, a, a founding member of the Metal and Allied Workers Union, um, which is the predecessor of NUMSA, which is, of course, one of the important unions in South Africa today. Um, he became, after the ANC achieved power in 1994, he became national spokesperson of the ANC from 1995 to 1997. He was an MEC for transport in Mpumalanga from 1997 to 1999. He then went to parliament where he stayed until his death. Uh, he was also a national spokesperson again at the beginning of the Zuma administration until 2014. Uh, he was also the ANC's chief whip in parliament um, from 2016 to 2019. And uh, an interesting story, actually, from his time when I was just looking up some stuff about his past. He uh, he was criticized by the pro Zuma ANC in 2017 for allegedly colluding with the DA to schedule a debate on skate, skate, state capture in parliament um, in defiance of Jacob Zuma's request that there be a more inclusive process to investigate <laughs> state capture, which is, I believe the Zondo <laughs> uh, was the final result of that. Uh, so let me start with you, uh, Gabriel. Uh, what do you know about Jackson Tembu? What was your impression of him? And um, what uh, it's, I mean, do you think it's a big loss for the ANC? Yeah, I think it's harsh to say, but definitely the best of a bad bunch. Uh, I think a hearty man, very well respected in the media, because when uh, media players, both under Zuma and under Becky, when, when ANC uh, leaders were trying to freeze out the media, Jackson and Timber was into more openness, more transparency, more conversation, try and convince people rather than try and force people. You can just see by how he relates. He had a natural charisma. He had a, a natural warmth. There's a tragedy to that too. Um, he had a very difficult family life. His daughter committed suicide recently. His son... Uh, is reported to be addicted or has been addicted to uh, heavy drugs, Neopa in particular. And uh, I think that, you know, he just seems to be like a good guy who's who who didn't always get it uh, lucky in his life. And I think if there's one poignant thing to remember, it's the dignity of his state funeral. I watched quite a bit of it, and it really was – uh, by any standard, an extraordinarily dignified affair. But if you compare that to the last two uh, major uh, ANC leader funerals, you've got uh, most famously uh, Nelson Mandela with a, with a translator uh, who, who, who can't really sign, making signs for fog donkey and, you know, do the washing and, uh, you know, here's a lighter. 
uh, during one of the world's most important funerals of the 21st century, completely undignified disgrace. Then you've got uh, Maponya, Richard Maponya, uh, one of the great Sowetan capitalists who had spoken out against BE, had spoken out against a lot of ANC policy, but was then adopted in death once it was too late for him to be able to keep his voice true uh, by the ANC, which threw him a grand funeral. And then the uh, military or the police couldn't even uh, march down the church's aisle without bumping into each other and making themselves a laughingstock, a disgrace. Now, Jackson and Tembu was spared that. Uh, his name was honored. And I think that's important. And yeah, I think it is. I think it's a tribute to him how many people that are uh, fiercely opposed uh, on political lines have uh, have have been heartily moved and mourned his loss. Uh, I think that's uh, yeah, it's a tribute to his character and uh, and to the character of this country. Sometimes we can see through uh, the political stuff to the human side, and that matters. Definitely. Morris, uh, your thoughts? Um, uh, it looks like, you know, the sort of really solid guys in the ANC are, are getting very, very few and far between now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I just want to echo what uh, Gabriel said. Uh, Jackson and Tambu definitely seem to be one of the good guys. Uh, as you mentioned, his uh, daughter committed suicide a few years ago and his son was apparently a drug addict. But uh, Jackson and Tambu himself also, uh, he, a few years ago, he was actually drawing money in an ATM in Whitbank. And he was accosted and shot. Uh, obviously, he survived. Uh, but there were rumors at the time that it was actually an attempted hit because Jackson Tembu was one of the guys who was, you know, blowing the whistle on corruption and so on. And also read that Jackson Tembu's wife is apparently still uh, working as a nurse in a clinic. So it shows that uh, as a family, the, uh, him and his wife at least have, you know, devoted themselves to public service and to ordinary South Africans. So I think it says a lot about the man that his wife is still working, you know, an uh, uh, honest, hardworking job. I think that says a lot. And also just, uh, I, I was never fortunate enough to meet uh, Jackson Timber personally, but just you kind of got the vibe when he was speaking to the media and so on that he was considered uh, the media his equals. It wasn't with a lot of ANC politicians where, you know, it's not a conversation, it's more a lecture. I think especially two people that come to mind uh, immediately on Kosa Zana, Domini Zuma and uh, Fakila Mbalula. Where you know it's uh, th this is how it is, and that's that's what you're going to do. You know, it's not a kind. They, they don't seem to understand that uh, South Africans are citizens; they're not subjects. And I think Jackson Tembu got that. He considered South Africans. Uh, you know, he like he he knew that he was serving South Africans, not the other way around. So I think it is quite a big loss for the ANC. And as Gabriel said, you could see uh, people from across the political spectrum uh, said what a good good person he was, and. Um, Nick, you mentioned before this, you know, somebody who's uh, has a visceral hatred for the ANC, but they spoke about, you know, what a good guy Jackson Tembu was and, you know, he was a decent man. So I think it tells you something about the man and, you know, I think it's a loss for so for the ANC in particular, but I think South Africa in general too. Indeed. Um, I think uh, for more people would like him in the ANC than perhaps we would not be quite in the state that we're in right now. Anyway. If, if, uh, can I just say yeah, one sure. follow-up thing? Uh, yeah, sure that you alluded to in your question it does expose politically a problem for the anc which is that it had its its generation of lions who fought the struggle and used those struggle credentials to get away with sometimes murder uh and oftentimes theft and almost always maladministration there has not been a strong showing in terms of second generation anc leadership and uh, so something about the tragedy in Jackson's own life um, with uh, yeah, two parents who, who seem to be really hardworking, good, honest uh, Joes, as they say, uh, and, 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 their, and their children not really living up to that standard, tragically, uh, that does seem to somehow be a metonym for, for a grander problem for the ANC. Yeah, no, definitely. Oh, sorry, I, I thought I'd muted my microphone when I was, when I was typing there. Anyway. Uh, let us move on with those thoughts, um, and of course, we we uh, send our condolences to his uh, his family, who I'm sure are, are quite devastated by this. Um, now, Afroforum and a group of doctors have gotten back into the news now uh, because they have decided to take the Minister of Health, Dr. Zwele Mkizi, to uh, to court. Um, they filed papers in the Kharteng High Court, demanding uh, that doctors be allowed to issue the drug ivermectin. Uh, ivermectin is, I believe, in South Africa only allowed to be used on animals. 
um, but in other countries it can be used on human beings. I think it's tr originally an anti-malaria drug, um, but it has it has been found. Although I'm sure Gabriel will talk more about this uh, to uh, have have some positive effects towards COVID. Um, but I'll let Gabriel talk about that anyway. Uh, Afroforum said. We find ourselves in extraordinary circumstances. People die every day and healthcare practitioners are inundated. Every day costs more lives. Um, he said that ivermectin had been listed by the World Health Organization as an essential medicine and had been proven safe, according to Afroforum. Um, and uh, the government is, is, I think at the moment, they've basically banned the usage of this, this uh, drug on human beings. So let me start with you, Gabriel, because you've been very into the... Uh, the science of COVID and what's going on there. Um, firstly, what's your view on ivermectin um, from from what you've read and the doctors you've talked to? And uh, what's uh, what's your view on what government policy should be here? So I first started following the ivermectin story really uh, after Christmas uh, at the end of last year when a GP based in Santon gave me a call desperately to say, look, we need to take this thing seriously. Uh, there are, there are two kinds of studies uh, that I've looked into. One is the meta-analysis coming out of the University of Liverpool, which basically just means it's a study of studies, and they looked at seven studies, and each one of them independently is too small to give uh, conclusive results, but pull it all together, and you get a very, very high confidence level uh, in terms of the curative power of ivermectin. It doesn't cure everyone, but it does cure a lot of people, stop them from dying versus control groups. Uh, that's one kind of study. The other kind of study is called in vitro. Uh, in English, that is in test tube. So that's when you take some blood, it's got some COVID in it, you take some uh, ivermectin, you put it in there, then you wait a little bit, and then you see if there's any COVID left. Answer is no. Problem is high dosage. In order to completely wipe it out in test tubes, they've been using pretty high doses. Now, it's not clear uh, that if they had used lower doses that they wouldn't get the same results. But it is clear that um, uh, what is clear is that is that you want a higher dose than is ordinarily used for humans, ordinarily used for humans for as an antiparasitic more than an anti-malarial. Ivermectin was invented by the Japanese uh, about 50 years ago, a very reliable science, sort of uh, was a derivative of a plant product that they could sort of grow in their fungal fields. Um, but then was synthesized and has been in effective use in Africa and South America ever since. And part of the reason the Sa Santon doctor knew about it was because that he he treats, you know, rich, fancy people who go into the bush in Africa and they, uh, you know, come back a bit worried. I'm feeling a bit sick. Maybe I've got some terrible, you know, uh, parasite. And then uh, they get treated. So the personal story that I have about this is that I spoke to someone last week whose uncle had passed away. Uh, the family had asked for compassionate care treatment of ivermectin. Uh, the doctor said yes, but because we're very worried about this, we need all of the family to consent. That took another day because one of the family members was on the other end of the country. Uh, by the time they got that consent form back to the doctors, the doctor said, no, we can't do this because SARPA has changed its regulations to say no compassionate care whatsoever. Well, it's made explicit its regulations to say no compassionate care. You may only use ivermectin if it's in a trial. Now, the problem with trials is firstly, there are none as of excepting until today or yesterday with the University of Free State starting one. The other problem with trials is that if it's a proper trial, it's got to be controlled. That means 50% of the people are not getting ivermectin who are asking for ivermectin. They are getting sugar water, otherwise known as placebo. So that's a problem. Not everyone wants, some people are convinced that ivermectin is good. They don't want sugar water to be part of some experiment. They actually want the drug. Anyway, uh, as a result of this sort of uh, constraint, this legal constraint, uh, the family that I spoke to decided to illegally uh, smuggle ivermectin into the hospital and uh, supply it. And sure enough, the blood oxygen level went from 80%, which is pretty much death, to, I mean, you can survive 80% for a little while, but your organs are going to fail. Uh, to 97%, which is basically where you need your blood oxygen levels to be in a day and a half. So that's a very strong indication that ivermectin in this particular case, as it often does, uh, killed the virus. But this took five days to do. Two days with the regulation thing and three days to figure out how to smuggle it in illegally. 
And so by that stage, he'd been on a ventilator for about eight, nine, ten days, and his heart gave out, so he died of a heart attack. Uh, so that's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that might have been avoided if you had compassionate care usage. What is compassionate care usage? It's a very old and well-established formulation in legal medicine. The idea is if something, if a medicine is being used off-label, that means it's being used for a purpose for which it was not already tested. The doctors are going in knowing what kinds of dosages work uh, within a certain range. And so the compassionate care usage uh, formula says you better use it within that range. This is compassionate care because this is not a standard prescription. You're asking for this because we don't know that it works for this particular thing. We don't have enough uh, controlled trials. But you can take the risk knowing what the side effects are for all things excepting for the most particular thing, which is having the disease that you're treating for, because that can also have a side effect. Uh, so you are taking a risk, but you are weighing up that risk of using something that has been trialed, but that has not been perfectly trialed for this particular situation. You're weighing up that risk with the risk of death, which becomes almost certain at a, at, after long enough on a ventilator, or even when you, you know, you're a day from getting onto the ventilator, there's a very serious chance of death. You weigh up those two risks, and you're saying, uh, that you want to take the former risk rather than the latter risk. That is a very well-established legal practice because guess what? Uh, medicines uh, don't fall from the sky like rain. They are invented, which means there's always a point at which the medicine has been invented, but it hasn't been trialed, and people want to give it a go. And that is absolutely what should be allowed here. Every forum has once again come to the table with muster, with money, to put pressure where... Words alone will not suffice. They did this earlier in the year. We applied pressure on government, uh, threatening to sue uh, to get the vaccine uh, more readily accessible and more privately accessible in South Africa. But AfriForum then went quickly to take it to court, and they're doing a very good thing there. They did a very good thing there. They're doing a very good thing here as well. Um, I just want to wrap up with two quick points. No one should be calling anything a miracle cure. It's a very stupid, stupid word that is used recklessly. And Donald Trump called hydroxychloroquine a miracle cure. It was a stupid thing to say. It was immediately used to pillory him and the idea of using hydroxychloroquine. Trials for hydroxychloroquine were put on stall when remdesivir, which is $2,500 a treatment versus uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine is like $2 a treatment. Remdesivir was accelerated. Hydroxychloroquine was put on pause. Guess what? I just read an article in the England Journal of Medicine which says hydroxychloroquine through a meta-analysis is a perfectly sane, good treatment, the kind of thing you might want to take uh, for COVID. Not as good as ivermectin promises to be. And if you want to get in the way of ivermectin becoming an option for people, call it a miracle cure because that is going to scare doctors. Uh, it's going to scare politicians. And it's going to scare regulators away from doing the reasonable thing, which is allow people to make an informed choice. And if you're informed, you know that there are risks of side effects. And if you're informed, you know that you could still die even if you do take it. So informed choice over silly billy shenanigans where you either call something a miracle cure or you call it deadly poisonous because if you inject yourself as if you've got the same weight as a horse, uh, you might go blind. Okay, that's also silly, you know. Uh, and, 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 and allowing compassionate care usage is exactly the best way out of it because then you don't have people using horse medicine uh, and injecting themselves as if they weigh as much as two elephants. You have doctors that are trained doing the job. Right. And and, that, and I forgot to mention that uh, Afriform, I believe, also made that case. And I think, Morris, I'll go to you now. There's a bit of a, this is a sort of old liberty issue here, right? Which is about firstly allowing people the autonomy and the, uh, the right to make choices over their own bodies. Um, but also uh, beyond that, it's it's a it's an argument against a kind of prohibition. So of course, one of the reasons why everyone is talking about ivermectin is that it is used by farmers uh, to treat animals, to get rid of parasites, and as a result, um, there's a kind of black market trade now in ivermectin, in which some people appear to have probably overdosed on it because they weren't doing it with a the doctor; they were just kind of eyeballing it. So, so Morris, uh, uh, do you agree with that? Am I right? Uh, what, what's your thought on this whole compassionate care issue? Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's also a good point on uh, people need to have control of their own bodies. And if you're fighting something like COVID, and if you want to try Invermectin, it's up to you, if, as long as you know the risks and so on. I think it comes down to all kinds of things. I mean, 
abortion rights, euthanasia rights, and I think they all uh, kind of link to this. Uh, as long as you know uh, the risks that you, uh, when it comes to taking these kinds of things, uh, I think you should be allowed to try it as long as you've been, you know, sound mind, sound body, and the doctors explained it uh, carefully to you, then I think, uh, yeah, then I think it's, you should be allowed to try it. I mean, it's your body, and if you want to, you know, and also like Gabriel said, if you're already at 80% oxygen, blood oxygen level, you pretty much, you're going to die soon anyway, so you're probably prepared to try anything. And also, I think that's also a good point about uh, prohibition. We all know prohibitions don't work. I mean, uh, to, uh, we've seen it in South Africa with the, the alcohol bans and so on. We saw it in America in the 1920s with other things. There's prohibition of uh, ho um, most, you know, of hard uh, illegal drugs in South Africa. I mean, I suppose they're obviously they're prohibited if they're legal, but I mean, uh, people still take drugs that are legal, so, you know, people... Rather, it's the same. I think it's the same kind of uh, argument you can make with abortion. People are going to get abortions anyway, so make sure that if people want an abortion, that there's a qualified doctor who can help the person. Same with invermectin. If people want to well, try it, make sure that they are, you know, there's there's going to be a qualified doctor that helps them with it. Uh, Gabriel and I actually, I believe, did a podcast on on abortion, which uh, uh, let's just say uh, we think that you're not quite framing the issue here correctly, um, but. That's a that's a question for another. That's a, if we start on that, we're never going to get off. Yeah, so, I'm I'm um, I'm a, a pro-choice guy for the record, but yeah, we can talk about that. No, 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 we know. Uh, yeah, Gabriel and I <laughs> talk about that. Um, Boris yeah, is also pro-Brexit and pro <laughs> Cyrus. Let's <laughs> let's not. <laughs> let's not I'm not the body parts of my life. Pro pixies, man. <laughs> that's what they all say. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, any final thoughts on this this Gabriel before we move on? Yeah, no, no, I think, I think, I think the principle that Marius is appealing to is right. Informed choice, liberty over your own body. Uh, just give it a go. I, I suppose if there's anything else to say, it's that we shouldn't, fact, rolling out the vaccine and aiming for the vaccine, it's all good and well, but you can't just uh, go for one solution. You know, people want to talk about cures. Uh, that's also something to talk about. Right. Um, silver bullet thinking, it's almost always a bad idea. And mm -hmm. in this case, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gabriel, we talked about this all, well, mostly Gabriel, um, on our uh, Two Crickets in a Thorn Tree podcast, which you can find on the Daily Friend, um, uh, dailyfriend.co.ca. Anyway, let's move on now to our last story. Um, so we had a, there's, there's, you know, there's been a lot of places around the world. I think almost every single free society on earth has, has seems to have had some sort of internal trouble uh, due to COVID restrictions. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a lot of people are upset because lockdowns and things are very damaging to people's um, welfare and health and uh, enjoyment of life. And uh, the latest outbreak of this appears to be in the Netherlands, uh, not a country known for its internal strife. And yet um, clashes broke out on Sunday in Amsterdam, Eindhoven and Stein um, over the introduction of a nationwide curfew in the Netherlands to try and uh, reduce the spread of uh, COVID. Um, this is the first curfew that has been seen in the Netherlands since the Second World War. Uh, there was also a group of people who burned down a viral testing center in a town called Urk, uh, which is a small fishing city. Um, uh, there, there were clashes with police. Um, police intervened in, in Amsterdam's central museum square where hundreds of protesters gathered. Um, and there, there was a uh, fear of riots. Uh, there was a fear of a riot and uh, disease spreading event. So the mayor designated the square as a high risk zone and gave the power to preemptively frisk people for weapons. More than a hundred people were arrested on Sunday. Morris, looks like the Dutch are not being as chilled as their reputation uh, 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 normally is. Well, I think what's happening, I think, uh, well, firstly, um, I'm not a COVID skeptic, but I'm definitely a lockdown skeptic. And I'm not sure if uh, lockdowns work. And I think that's probably what a lot of people are starting to feel. If, if lockdowns did work, then we'd have got rid of COVID last year. And obviously we didn't. And I think uh, we've probably also just got to, for the, we've got to the end of a lot of people's tether. It's one thing to tell people, cool, we're going to have this lockdown. We're going to do a hard lockdown for a month. And afterwards, everything will go back to normal. It's different if we have them. You know, we have a lockdown for two months and everything's normal for two weeks and have another lockdown for two or three months. And I think apart from how it damages people's businesses and the damage it's probably doing to kids who are not going to school and so on, I think it's also, I mean, human beings are social creatures. I mean, you need to be able to uh, see other people and interact, whether it's your friends or just strangers in, you know, at uh, 
you know, places where there's uh, lots of other people and so on. But that said, that, that said at the same time, I'm glad I'm not making decisions like people like Silver Ramaphosa and Boris Johnson. Because one thing for me to say, lockdowns obviously don't work, but it's obviously a knee-jerk reaction by governments. And, you know, when, if a whole bunch of people die from COVID, that's, uh, I'm not the one who's going to be carrying the can for that. But uh, like Mark Ritter, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, or as I say, Boris Johnson, or Silver Ramaphosa, they'll be the kinds of people who, uh, the ones who are going to have to carry that responsibility. But uh, also that said, I do think there has been, uh, I'm not really a conspiracy guy, but there does seem to have been kind of a power grab by a lot of governments around the world. I mean, 10 years ago, people, know, I don't think, would have accepted the lockdowns and what happened in the Netherlands, you know, and like this preemptive frisking and whatever. It's just, uh, there's... You know, it just seems to be governments have got a taste of power, which a lot of them quite like. And I think we should be very careful when things eventually go back to normal, and they will go back to normal. We mustn't think COVID is going to be this kind of thing that's going to be with us for 50 years and we're going to have to, be locked, uh, have to go into lockdowns forever. As we things need to, uh, we, uh, we have to remember that governments are in the service of the people, not the other way around. And I think that's an important thing to remember. But at the same time, people... Um, I actually was speaking to our colleague Sikhlam Gabesi earlier about this. People, you, nobody wants to get COVID. It's a nasty disease. People are in general sensible and are going to do what they can to not get it. Uh, there was Google movement data from South Africa it showed a week before our lockdown started, the people had stopped moving. Uh, there had been significant reductions in people's movements. People weren't going to work as much. They weren't going to shops as much. They definitely weren't going to restaurants or pubs as much because people know what they need to do to not get COVID. They'll wear masks if the you know if there's uh, the evidence on that seems to have been mixed, but people will wear masks. They'll sanitize. They'll they'll avoid crowded areas. So I'm not sure that we need to have this kind of these authoritarian lockdowns that we've seen around the world. And I mean. As I said, I'm not sure they work, and also think it reduces trust in governments, which is also going to be a serious problem going forward if uh, governments don't manage to win this trust back. Gabriel, you agree? Yeah, I mean, I gotta say, humble brag. Like, I think w maybe the best thing I did last year was to be the first guy to write about Google mobility data in South Africa. Uh, to make exactly that point, that people aren't stupid ants that are just gonna like sneeze all over each other when there's a deadly virus around. Uh, in terms of what's going on in the Netherlands, you know, the, the story is a bit deeper. The government has just, the cabinet has just resigned, Mark Ritter, under Mark Ritter, just announced to the king mm. and queen. And the reason for that is a scandal about uh, child grants. So basically the Netherlands has the system where you can appeal to the government to sort of pay for some of the childcare that you get and then they look at your income and they look at how hard you work and they look at how many kids you have and then they figure out, okay, we'll pay 40% of the childcare. Uh, now that was instituted in 2004, in the 2013 about a bunch of Bulgarians were caught defrauding the Netherlands of about 400 million euros because they moved into the Netherlands, like set up shop, like got all kinds of government subsidies, took the money, cashed it out, went back to Bulgaria, thank you so much. Uh, and then that made Dutch people super upset. And so they said, well, we need to have strict anti-fraud uh, uh, legislation. And they came, they kind of overdid it. They said, if you, if there's something wrong with your documents, then that's fraud. And then we're going to take all of the money back. So if we've given you like 5,000 euros over two years for childcare, we're going to take back all 5,000 euros. Now that makes sense if someone's defrauding the government and good on the Dutch for being able to do that. And they have prosecuted thousands of cases where they've taken the money back. Can you imagine? taking the money back that's been stolen. <laughs> just imagine it. Just imagine it. You can do it. It's been done. Problem is they took money back from people who literally just made, like put a hyphen where they should have put a comma in the forms. Other problem is that, uh, and so that's a serious problem and they've apologized for it and they've already given a lot of those people the money back and then paid them compensation for the strife of calling them uh, corrupt or fraudsters, uh, thousands of euros. Uh, but on top of that, there's this political issue where they specifically targeted investigations against people with dual citizenship. Now, to my mind, that's not necessarily wrong, but obviously to a lot of people with social identity worries, that's racist. Uh, and so uh, the, the Turkish president's own newspaper is the first thing that'll come up in your Google results about this. Amsterdam, the Netherlands proved that they're racist. And uh, this is why the government's fallen. And this is why people are now protesting because you've got a government that's fallen, but is still in charge. And, uh, and a reactionary movement that's saying, look, guys, if you're not really in charge, just uh, don't make up new rules. Um, so I think 
the, the, the general point that I'm trying to make here is that Marius was alluding to, and Nicholas was alluding to the, the sorts of lockdown strife that you've had around the world. It's always been inflected by particular local political issues. Uh, and I find that very interesting, that sort of dance between the virus and the, and the memes in politics, the viral memes in politics. Uh, that, that's that's uh, ineluctable. Well, I've heard uh, COVID's also been called the trends accelerator, and I think that's right. So a lot of trends we're seeing probably, you know, they just accelerated them. What would be happening in 10 years from now if the trends carried on are happening today, for example. So I think, yeah, I think I mean, this is definitely going to be, this is, COVID's definitely a before and after events, you know. Things are definitely different after it came along. Same as, say, 9-11 or the murder of France Ferdinand. Excepting that I think the virus, and you can listen to two crickets on this, I think the virus is going to be around for longer than all of us. But all, I mean, the Spanish flu is also is still around. I mean, but I don't think it's going to be. Uh, we're not going to be able to lock down for the every year for the next hundred years, for example. Yeah, yeah no, this, this, I think this period. I think it's a, definitely true. This period will be decisive Locked, in some. Lockdown will go away, but COVID won't. Mm, that's yeah. that's my claim. Mm. That's fine. Uh, I'd like to say Spanish flu. Yes. <laughs> 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 the world goes upside down, Nicholas. All right, that's, that, that's a sign that we need to end now. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for listening to us or watching us. Uh, if you'd like to support the IRR, you can go to our website, irr.org.za, and click the Join Us button. Anyway, thanks very much, everyone. Have a wonderful week, and we shall see you very soon. Tomorrow, in fact. <laughs>